May I ask everybody to please rise as we give honor to the Word of God, John 10, 33 to 42. We end John 10 this morning. John 10, 33 to 42 reads, The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture, scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, You are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him and eluded their grasp. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing and he was staying there. And many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. You may be seated. Our topic this morning is uh, very critical informationally and theologically. Your salvation depends on it. Your Christology determines your eternity. Maraming theology, it's not salvific. It will not uh, affect your salvation, such as your dispensation, yung end times uh, theology mo whether the timing of God's return is uh, premillennial, postmillennial, or all those uh, eschatological terminologies. Kung anong paniniwala mo dyan, it's not going to affect your salvation. Or even um, your belief, I would uh, say, in terms of uh, salvation, yung once saved, always saved, you've heard that before? Even if you believe, as we so-called Calvinists say, that once God saves you, you cannot lose that salvation, which the so-called Armenians refute. Even if you don't believe that, that's operant in you. You'll still be saved. Your, your salvation cannot be canceled. So, hindi siya information that if you got wrongly, you cancel out your salvation, so to speak. But today's, in, today's passage is influential in terms of your understanding and your standing in terms of salvation. Who Jesus is? Sino siya? Si God or si man? In our country, one of the, if not the biggest religion, claims that he's a good man, a great prophet, even named their religion after the name of Christ, but claims over and over in, in the TV programs that I watch regularly for information and learning that he is not God. And it is clear that if you believe that, that will affect your salvation. In fact, you will not be saved if you believe that Jesus is not God and mere man. Last week, we ended uh, the message with uh, verses 30 and 31 with that clear declaration. I and the Father are one, says the Master. And the Jews rejected it. They took up stones again to stone him. He was showing grace in the face of this very violent response to his claim of deity. But instead of withdrawing his claim or softening his stand of being equal with God and being God, he forced them to face and deal with that reality through the miraculous good works that he's been doing. As we read in our first text, in our first verse, for good works we do not stone you, but for blasphemy and because you being a man, make yourself out to be God. God's enemies understand what, that he was claiming that and Jesus did not refute it. And he said, oh wait, wait you, you misunderstood me. He didn't say that. The works offered as evidence were visible, tangible, and inescapable proof of his oneness with God. The witness which I have is greater than of John, John the Baptist. For the works which the Father has given to me, given me to accomplish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. These are agents of faith. How you get saved? His words? Just like Psalm 19 is saying, two major revelations that God gave to man to tell you that there is a God. 
two types of revelation, Psalm 19. General revelation, the stars above, as Immanuel Kant said, the starry skies above me, and the reality of God within me tells me the reality of the divine. May mga signal from God that He exists, whether you're a devout Christian or a rabid atheist, you cannot deny that information is given to man. And this works like the words are information given out for your salvation or affirmation of your damnation. But you will be responsible for this information. We always talk about, we always talk about the words of Christ being an agent of salvation or an agent of affirmation of damnation. If you accept it, it saves you. If you reject it, that affirms rejection which justify your damnation. Today, works ang sinasabi ng Panginoon. My works testify of me. So these are agents of faith that even today, today's Christians are entitled to, are privy to, not just Christians, but the in, entire humanity. Words, works, and I will add circumstance. These are the things that God makes operant in the life of each individual to signal to him that I'm here. I am God. Here the Pharisees, the leaders, the Jewish leaders who knows the law, they had all the information to affirm that the long prophesied Messiah is here. He's fulfilling these hundreds of messianic prophecies. This one person is fulfilling it. Should have affirmed to them, not only in words but in deeds, that this indeed is the Messiah God that's been prophesied for them. The miracles of Jesus were witness to the deity and messiahship of this God-man. And thus proved that he was not a blasphemer as in fact his opponents were. So, bringing it down to our time today, if you proclaim after all you've heard that Jesus Christ is man, you're in the same league as these people. You're a blasphemer if you call Jesus us. Man only and not God. The greater the amount of information you receive, the greater the gravity of your rejection. The greater the amount of works they saw, the greater the gravity of their rejection. I went immediately to current application. We as Christians, we as re receiver of God's words, our circumstance also affirm the presence of God in our lives. We also reject that. Maybe doubt, maybe sin makes us reject. But there's already a divine tug, hila, o tulak. But men, one, for one reason or another, reject that tug. A lot of times it's sin, because if you believe in Almighty God, in this case, if they believe that Jesus is God, there's a cost. They have to turn away from their profitable ritualistic religion, Judaism. The cost was too great, so they rejected the witness of the works. The Lord's question, for which of my works do you stone me? Put the Jewish leaders in the awkward position of opposing the very public and popular things that he had done. Healing the sick, the sick, feeding the hungry, liberating the demon possessed, and even raising the dead. Which divine signals do we receive make us more culpable for the faith that we reject? But they were not deterred by any miracles. Unlike the formerly blind man, remember the blind man who was healed? who had drawn the proper conclusion from his circumstance, from the word, words that he heard from the master, and the miraculous deeds that's, that was performed to him. Unlike this blind man, healed blind man, the angry mob, the rejectors, simply brushed the works aside. Like I always say, if you're not willing to verify Despite it's being heavily verifiable, you have to vilify. Pag ni-reject mo ang Panginoon, 
you have to create something to vilify him with. So they wanted to accuse him of blasphemy. Not only are you not true, we have to convict you of something to justify our rejection. And again, import nyan. Today's world. Each person is programmed with a divine, divine tug, tug, T-U-G. Hugot, hatak. You only refuse that tug when you realize the consequence of going with that tug. He's God, therefore. He's almighty, therefore. I must surrender everything to Him. Too much. Over and over in Scripture, that's the dynamics. But the evidence is clear. That's why yung culpability is severe. Because the more evidence you reject, the more severe the evidence of your rejection. Their minds were made up. Their love of sin held them captive to Satan, death, and judgment. And in contrast to those in today's time who deny that Christ ever actually claimed to be God, like the INC, the Iglesia de Cristo, he never really claimed that. You guys are putting words in his mouth. Or the JW. These people in Scripture, the hostile Jews, understood perfectly what he meant. He was saying exactly that, that he is God. But they refused to consider the possibility that this claim might be true. He didn't only reject that he was saying it, they just rejected that it's true. Today's cults, and by the way, that's one definition of a cult, Christology, who Christ is. No matter how much they um, praise the works of Christ and, and yet call him man, that's a cult per our definition. They refuse to accept that possibility. So their ultimate reaction to the rejection was a plot to kill him. And as you know, we're just a few more months to the crucifixion. We're halfway through the book of John, but we're just a few more months before the end of the murder of the Lord Jesus Christ comes to. For this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because he not only, it's, it's like there's a frenzy. It's like the reality is so compelling that you have to almost put power into the rejection. Kasi masyadong convinced. No, no, no. That's not true. Because, again, the consequence of accepting the truth that He is God, its consequence and cause is too much. So there's almost a frenzy to reject. Seeking all the more to kill Him. He not only was breaking the Sabbath, he was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So it's clear that he was not, and he did, the Lord Jesus Christ did not correct, huh? did not correct. So those who claim today that Jesus Christ never made that claim is wrong. They were accusing him of arrogantly promoting himself as God, but our Lord, in fact, the almighty God, was selflessly, selflessly humbled himself in becoming a man. It is the opposite of what they're saying. Minsan nga iniisip ko, as uh, we grow as Christians, as, I, as my pastoral prayers, our pastoral prayers, as I was mentioning, the more you grow as a Christian, the more you experience the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. The proclamation of the Lord that He is the great I Am, more and more as you mature, you almost say to yourself, you are the great I am, but I have uh, another great proclamation, the great why me? Why me? Do you ever wonder that? Bakit ka pinili? That's why, you know, this uh, controversial doctrine of election is really, ano, eh, if it's not in scripture, I would reject it. Eh. Why me? Why not him? So many better people than you. Ano ka suerte? Is that what it is? It's a draw of the lot? I don't know. But, he came down, the great I am, to save the least of the greatest, me and you. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
So I think one of the indicators that our love for the Lord is growing, one of the indicators is a great sense of unworthiness. Not to the point of depression, eh? wag naman, sobra na yun. But wanting to serve Him, not to get fire insurance so that you won't go to hell, not to get a fire extinguisher so He puts out the little fires in your life, but just out of gratefulness for what He already gave you, that God came down to save you and me. You know, I'm listening to a 12, uh, 12 message series by John MacArthur in, entitled The Battle for the Beginning, the, the fastness of God's creation. That traveling at 186,000 miles per second before you even reach the edge of the known galaxy or little galaxy, it'll take you thousands of years. Ganon kalawak. And yet, God came down to save you and me. It's unfathomable. But the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He humbled Himself for you and me. Philippians 2 exhorts us to have this attitude in yourself which was also in Christ Jesus who, although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Brethren, you need to fill your mind with these things of God that makes us wonder and fills us with awe. This life is short. You need to fill your mind with the reality of heavens that will make you operate on this earth in a heavenly manner. The important, it's important to note that Jesus, having been charged with blasphemy, knew exactly what his opponents were saying. And again, he never claimed that they had misunderstood him. I and the Father are one. In fact, they knew it to be his claim that he is God. Yung Christology of the major cults is really where you should look at. You know, even the... Um, I watched a video of uh, the Mormons. I watched this video and they said, uh, in the beginning, there was a conference between Father God and brothers, Jesus and Satan. This is on the video. So the Father God was asking brothers on the table, Satan and uh, Jesus, say, What's the plan? And Satan made the presentation, strategic plan. Jesus made the plan. Jesus' plan worked, uh, was accepted. Satan's plan was rejected. Satan rebelled. Can you believe that? But they're Christology. But the question is, God came down. He's saying in our passage today, I am God. They refuse it. They want to kill him. But I want to park a little bit in this question that's lingering in my mind. Why did it have to be God? He came down clearly to save us, right? To be the Savior. Why? Bakit? Bakit? Bakit siya? Why, why God the Creator? He could have said, Gabriel, I'm gonna promote you to the top general if you go down and redeem mankind. I'm sure Gabriel will be. Yes, sir. Why is it God? Well, I don't know, but uh, as I read my Bible, one thing uh, latched on my mind, a reality, and I'm sure there are several reasons why it's God who came down to save us. Like I said the last time, ours is the only religion where the king dies for the subjects. Most religions, the subjects are in fear of their gods, and they serve with fear and trembling the deity. But in our case, it is our God who died for us. So I was thinking about it, applied to myself. Let me just read you a few verses. And again, this is not to me what the Bible is saying is the main reason. It might be. But to me, this is the most impactful reason that I can connect to me personally, and I'm sure a lot of you can as well. Why it had to be God to come down. Nagsakatawan tao. And I like that word, the incarnation. Incarne. <laughs> Flesh, yun yun eh. It's so literal. The root, incarnate. Incarnation. God becoming flesh. Let me start with Romans 6.23. A passage all familiar to all of you. As one of the reasons 
why God had to come down for the wages of sin is death. And as, he, as the Lord says in the Old Testament, I have, I have elevated my word above my name. Meaning if I said it, that if you sin, you die. That has to happen. But also, in Old Testament, all throughout, that the payment for the wages of sin is death, and the payment for that sin had to be a perfect sacrifice. It's all over. Ezekiel 43, 21, 22. You should also take the bull for the sin offering. And this is the sacrificial, symbolic, messianic uh, symbol for the payment for sin. It cannot just be any old sacrifice. It had to be a perfect sacrifice to replace the sin that condemns humanity. The sin offering shall be burned. A male goat without blemish for a sin offering. Exodus 29.1 Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, to minister as priests to me. Take one young bull, two rams without blemish. Ezekiel 43.25 For seven days you shall prepare the daily gold for a sin offering, also a young bull, a ram for the flock without blemish. Ezekiel 45, thus says the Lord God, in the first month, on the first of the month, you shall take a young bull without blemish. Ezekiel 46, and the burnt offering which the prince shall offer to the Lord on the Sabbath day shall be six lambs without blemish. A ram without blemish. And then I thought about it. Only the blemished, like myself and like you, those who really realized that they needed that salvation, realizing how blemished they are, would appreciate that it had to be God. Because no other sacrifice will do. What God said, He had to be the sacrifice because He is the only entity without blemish. And we read this in Hebrews 9, 11 to 15, but when Christ appeared, as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, not through the blood of goats and cows, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. If the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, temporary cleansing. How much more will the blood of Christ who threw the eternal spirit of himself without blemish. If he didn't die, your salvation is temporary. It's only flesh. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God and for this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgression that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal heavens, eternal inheritance. Are you asleep yet? Did that put you to sleep? That passage, such a long passage, I told Pastor George, don't put too many passages. That's just a preference, you might not agree with that. But I had to put all that there. And not, not making a judgment call. But only the blemished can appreciate the unblemished coming down. If you don't realize and continue to realize how dirty we are, how much sin we had, and how much sin still permeates, so that the once and for all salvation we had, the blood that cleansed us forever, continue to cleanse us in terms of our sanctification. This is mere religion. That gasoline that empowers obedience, not out of performance, you obey out of gratefulness and gratitude. It's something you don't understand. God came down because he was executing his own law. That the without blemish take the place of the blemished you and me. And every time you sin, you remember. Today is, uh, we do the Lord's Supper. When you take that cup, that's why it's one of the two remaining ordinances that we do in the church. All the ritualistic, the hundreds of rituals have been removed. We only maintain two. The Lord's Supper and baptism, both symbolic of the Lord's sacrifice, God coming down. And we forget, don't we? We forget. And I'm not preaching down on you. 
when I preach hard, I, I, I shout at myself, nakakalimutan mo, you forget. That's why you, you, you wander around Monday to Saturday acting as if God is not there. You worry about things that should not worry you. You forget that the God who died for your sins created everything. And sometimes I say, Lord, why me? Such vast knowledge, such little faith. Mabuti na lang. It had to be you to save little old me. You know, there's a, in the corporate world, when there's negotiation, argumentation, and heavy dealings, sometimes you don't allow your competitor to finish his sentence. So one time, somebody slammed me. He was talking, I was negotiating with the multinational. He said, let me finish! I never forgot that. You can't, you can't argue with that. Eh? When somebody tells you, he's still talking, you interrupt, and then he said, let me finish. Parang bastos ka I'm still talking. You know, Romans 6.23 is like that. Romans 6.23. As I began that litany of blemish and without blemish. We always say, for the wages of sin is death. But you don't finish. Because that whole passage says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But it's right. You have to say that for the wages of sin is death first. That's why in preaching, C.H. Spurgeon said, preach 10% grace, 90% law. Did you hear that? But a lot of times we preach 90% grace, 10% law. Then we forget the cost to God for saving us why God had to come down. Because when you preach 90% law and that in the end just finish it with 10% grace then give him the good news, then they'll appreciate. You have to get them lost, still C.H. Spurgeon says, before you have them found. But we're so quick to say that God came down without explaining the gravity of that unilateral movement of God creator, of himself coming down to save us, that we ignore and undervalue the free gift of God, which is eternal life. It had to be him. And I pray that as we walk out this morning, we would develop that core appreciation, understanding that God bought us. We were bought with a price. That takes serious prayer. Because we're generally unappreciative people. We take for granted. In fact, sometimes, if our entry point to salvation is weak, we take that for granted and even make demands from God instead of appreciation. Now, we're going to shift gears now and continue with the passage. Verses 34 to 36. Now, again, the Pharisees rejected all that. They rejected all that. We don't reject it overtly, but practically sometimes we reject it. I leave it up to you for self-examination. Talking about Jesus being God, God coming down to earth to redeem you. How do you react to that? Do you say it overtly, yes, I believe in that, and live our lives as if it didn't happen? Living lives that are not committed to Him? Living as paid souls redeemed by God and now owned wholly by God I leave that up to you now let's shift Jesus here again in our passage is talking to unbelievers mostly there are some believers in the crowd but specifically the Jewish leaders Jesus answered them in their doubt has it not been written in your law He's still arguing because they're really virulent now they're, they want to kill him I said you are God hindi ba sinabi sa but us, the Pentateuch and all the, all the, the law and the prophets, you are God's little g. If you call them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God. Now, um, the cults have used this uh, to confuse. No? But basically what Jesus here is saying is that the 
holders of the law before, in today's world, the pastors, in, 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 the, in the case of the Old Testament, the judges, those who were given the right to preach the law of God, to spread the word of God, are basically representatives of God, little g. No? Sila yung, they're not God gods, but since they represent God through the preaching of the word, they are representatives of God. The very law, a reference of the entire Old Testament, not just the Pentateuch, the Jews Christ. So he used this term, little gods, which is a reference of Psalm 82, 6, where God rebuked Israel's unjust judges, calling them God's little g, in a far lesser sense, because they ruled as his representatives and spokesmen spokesmen of the world. Let me read to you that passage that Jesus here is referring to. He's quoting scripture actually. This is a rebuke actually. They do not know nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness and the foundation of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. You're preachers of the word. And all you are sons of the most high. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like any of the princes. It was a rebuke. The Jewish leaders could not dispute that the fact that those judges, preachers, men of the word were called God's little g. Now, here's a comment from John MacArthur on this difficult passage. If mere men who were evil could in some sense be called gods because of their preaching of the word, how could it be inappropriate for Jesus, the one whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, to call himself the Son of God. The point is not to add to the evidence of his deity. It is simply a rebuke on the level of the Pharisees' overreaction to the use of the word God in reference to Jesus. Jesus here is proving that he is entitled to the title God in the full sense as he would affirm again in verses 37 and 38. They were merely the judges, the little gods. They were merely those to whom the word of God came and distributed. Jesus was the incarnate word. So Jesus here, knowing his battling intellectually with these Pharisees, quoted an Old Testament passage. Now, again, you know, uh, a dispute. The calls would use that, that passage to say, Okay, tamo, tao lang siya. But his aim here is not to put himself on a level with men, but he was setting himself apart. They were distributors. I myself is the incarnate word. And that is clear, that he is God. John 1.1 1, 1 reads, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's in reference to Christ. And again, John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh, incarnation, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. You wonder why the cults are so huge and financially prosperous and numerically so vast. You know why? Empowered by satanic forces. Because they're holding on to key errors that damns man. Sabi nila, the sign of a blessed church is its success, its numbers, its finances. You can say the same thing for Playboy. Vast Successful, sustainable. Is Hugh Hefner still around? Now he knows the truth. So we continue, John 37. John 10, 37. The Lord repeats, reiterating who he is. If I do not, if I do, not do the works of my Father, again, he's going back to the prima facie evidence. After arguing, pulling Old Testament, you don't believe the word, believe the works. And I think it's the same 
tag. Totoo yung the drawings we see in the evangelistic tracks. The devil and the angel pulling at you, in a sense, metaphorically. Pulling at you. But not physically, but theologically. What you believe about Christology. Who you listen to, what you listen to. That's why the noble Bereans were praised. When Paul was preaching, he was saying, if what Paul was saying was so. Doubt everything. And put everything to the test of Scripture. The plumb line of Scripture. Verse 37 of John 10, we continue. If I do not do the works of my Father, the proof of works do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, and this is not just talking about the miracles, it's just talking about works that they knew were prophesied. Hindi lang to yung miracles. Ha? This is talking about events and the Jews who memorizes, okay? This is talking about Pharisees who memorize verbatim the first five books of the, pen, the scripture, the Pentateuch. Kabisado nila. So when the messianic prophecies were happening, they knew. That's the miracle that the Old Testament was talking about. So when that was happening, it's not just the, the fantastical miracle. It's the events happening, unfolding as prophesied hundreds of years ago. Them being the holders of the law, knew the events are unfolding. Severe culpability. Believe the works. Believe the unfolding of the evidence of the messianic prophecies happening before your eyes. Let me just localize it. What are the things God is showing in your life that you're rejecting? Knowing it's coming clear from Scripture, but you reject, take it out of your mind. Same culpability. If you're a non-Christian, that will damn you. If you're a Christian and you ignore that, that will discipline you. A little practical application. And as he had so for so many times, with annoying patience, if I can say that, Jesus annoying patience, and I'm glad he has annoying patience because he has patience with me. He appealed again. Tingnan nyo, look, look. Look at the evidence of the works around you, your circumstance, the unfolding prophecies. Look around you. Your sin and your guilt is growing. By the way, this is the last time that Jesus talks to these guys. Kung sa ano, this is the last call. This ends Jesus' public ministry to these people. After this, it spurs to swine. You know, you know that... Uh, you know that principle of pearls to swine? Don't throw pearls to swine. Don't give truth to baboy anymore. Bababuyin lang nila yan. Boy, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad God is patient. That he didn't treat me as baboy a long time ago. He just kept, Jay, listen. You listen. You repent. Ultimately, I repented. Ultimately, I repented. You know, I grew up in Sunday school. Four years old, I was attending Sunday school. I repented 30s na eh. Boy, I'm glad he's a patient God. Hearing all those truths, Sunday school, four years old. Repented 34. Boy, I'm dumb, huh? D-U-M dumb. I'm glad he's patient, so massive patience, but still that patience is an end. Don't abuse it. And this is the last time. This is his last public ministry. After this, he only talks to true disciples. So, there is desperation in their minds to kill him. There is desperation in the mind of Christ to save them. But there is an end to that grace. Incredibly, the religious leaders of Israel were so spiritually blind that they could not recognize God's works, even though they've been reading about it, prophesying about it, studying it. If Jesus did not do the works of the Father, they would have been right in refusing to believe him. On the other hand, because he did them, he knew them, they knew, they, they knew it, it was prophesied to them. They should have put aside their reluctance to believe instead of counting the cost of believing the obvious evidence that right before them is the prophesied Messiah. They should have been willing to follow the evidence to its logical conclusion. Therefore, verse 39, we're almost done. They were seeking again to seize him, see? If, you don't ver if the truth don't verify it, you have to vilify. You have to give this. As the truth permeates and begins to convince you, intellectually, 
evidentially, but you refuse the truth because of its consequential resulting necessary repentance. Kung nire-refuse mo yan, kasi alam mo, dapat magsisi ka, you have to throw in an opposite, equally strong opposition and argumentation. So they were seeking again to, to seize him, so they wanted all the more. He eluded their grasp. That's it. Goodbye. Shake the dust. It was not his time. The Lord's challenge fell on deaf ears. Instead of considering the evidence the Jewish leaders responded as they had before seeking to seize him and kill him and shut him up. I don't want to listen to it. Have you, have you had teenagers like that or some people? You know, that, it's not God's will for you. I don't want to hear it. Shut up. I don't want to hear it. And he went away again the Jordan, beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing and he was staying. So thus ends Jesus' ministry, public ministry, to the Jewish leaders. And he went back where he started, where John was baptizing. Do not una nag appear si Jesus, I remember? When John was baptizing, behold the Lamb of God, he went back to that place where he started. The rejection was final. Back to square one. So eto na, some were believing, some were not. Some believed and embraced him. There were the, this is the ambivalent crowd. The time of Pastor Dennis, the, the singing group. The ambivalent crowd. Hati na eh. John 7, 12. There were much grumbling. Some were saying he's a good man. Some on the contrary are saying he leads the multitudes away. Astray. John 7, 43. There arose a division. Some of them wanted to seize him. Some wanted to lay hands on him. Some of the multitudes wanted to believe him. John 9, therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? There was a division among them. John 11, many therefore of the Jews who had come to Mary beheld what he had done, believed him, and some of them went away to the Pharisees to help condemn him. Where are you? You have to react to the evidence. The evidence... What you're hearing this morning, and we're almost done, is not static. There is a response to what you're hearing. There is a response to what you're hearing. If you're an unbeliever, if you're not surrendered your life to Christ, this information is the most dangerous information you're hearing. Because it either saves you or it hardens you. And that's what happened to the Pharisees. It hardened them. And verse 4 to 1, and, But many came to him and were saying, While well, John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was so. Now remember, if the Pharisees hear you say that loudly, pag narinig ka, what's gonna happen to you? You were a synagogue. Basically, you lose your citizenship. They'll persecute you. This you say anything positive about Jesus, you will be on synagogue. And many believed in him there. And again, the doctrine of the remnant. Many, not too many, but many in that place where he began are probably the few hundred twenty people who were left. Three years of ministry, active ministry, le about hundred plus lang natira. These are probably those people. The tug. <laughs> but decisions were made and so Jesus public ministry closed with one last rejection by the very leaders the very holders of the prophecies the truth who should heal him and announced him and this I say listen to this we're almost done but this I say about them and applied to us the gravity the gravitas of a well-informed choice the gravity of the culpability of a well-informed choice. You make your choice after hearing these messages in John and even Matthew. That is a graver decision than uninformed rejection. Their rejection foreshadows his final rejection a few months later when the people under their influence cried out, crucify him. Even today, as we close, there are many who, like the hostile Jews, Jewish nation, allow their preconceived ideas about religion, the religious systems that they are under, calling Christ mere man, and their love for sin, 
Dalawa lang eh. Your preconceived religion, ay mo iwanan yung alam mo, alam mo na mali. We, we, we keep wondering. People are saying, oh, we like your preaching. It's accurate. It's, you know, it's long and it's loud. And sometimes it puts us asleep, but it's accurate. <laughs> and yet, they're still in that wrong system. Why? Preconceived ideas about the cause of living that religion or love for sin. It blinds them to the saving truth. A choice is made. Nonetheless, those who are drawn to him in repentance and faith come to know the truth of who he is and they act on it. Now listen to this. Those who are fundamentally, and this is the bottom line, those who are fundamentally committed to doing God's will, it's an issue of obedience. It's counting the cause of obedience. You, you choose your stand based on your willingness to obey or not to obey. But those who are fundamentally committed to doing God's will will be guided by him. Like the fireball of the seeds, immediately accepts and then finds the requirements of the law and then the thorns choke and they leave. But if you say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, hindi ko kaya, but I know that you'll change my heart and mold me as a new creation. This affirmation will be given. If any man is willing to do his will, listen to this, this is, this is a main entry door to wisdom and knowledge and, and divine revelation. If any man is willing to do his will, not saying can, willing, he shall know of the teaching whether it is of God. God's truth is self-authenticating. God's truth is self-authenticating through the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit which will indwell, indwell a true believer upon salvation through his humility and repentance. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Why are people in a false system? Like I told you, a question was posed a long time ago. Can a true Christian remain in a false religion? The answer is yes, but not for long. Can a true believer, a true Christian, saved, remain and stay in a wrong system? Yes, there, w there can be true believers, but they will not stay for long because truth is self-authenticating. The Holy Spirit in them, true believers, will guide them into truth and will lead them out. Two characteristics mark genuine Christians in this regard. Last time we said characteristics were obedience, but this time two other characteristics regarding clarity of information. Two are, these two are the uh, the Holy Spirit guarding them from error, Christ imparting the Holy Spirit, illuminating and guarding the believer from deception. So when you say they're sincerely wrong, that's not true. They're sincerely in rejection. And second, the Holy Spirit guides the true believer into knowing all things. True Christians have a built-in lie detector. It's not a matter of IQ. Madedetect man. Now, if you're a true believer in the wrong system and you stay, you're already disobedient. They have a, true Christians have a built-in lie detector and they will persevere in the truth regardless of the cost. Those who remain in heresy, those who remain in a wrong system, overtly or not so overtly, prosperity, not heresy, but teaching the word of God erroneously manifest probably that they were never generally born again. And I don't have to say this not, is this not a source of pride. This is a source of fear. Because even us, as true believers, we get it wrong all the time applicationally. And it's just, why me? Because I chose the foolish things of this world, heaven answers back. To the true sheep, sheep will be given the right to become children of God in the mind of God. And in our closing verse, just condenses what the Lord did for us. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let us pray. Lord, why an angel is not standing here and a mere inadequate man explaining, explaining 
the mind of God and the acts of God just leads us to thank you that you're sovereign. I thank you for the Holy Spirit in us that clarifies what mere man's mouth cannot even articulate with some sense. But I thank you for your word and I thank you for your coming down on earth to save me, to save us. Help us to honor you for the rest of our lives. Why don't you meditate for a minute and we will take the Lord's Supper together. Women of Grace, Tears and Fears, a new series on contentment. In the world of discontent, I love that word also, discontent. Disconte, conte lang. So this is about discontentment for the women at uh, McDonald's Commerce Avenue, August 3, 2018, 7 p.m. And Men of the Word, uh, Brother Tony Lim is, is speaking, I think, on the plumb line, a standard for uh, life of a godly man. These are interesting topics. This uh, coming Saturday, August 4, 7.30, McDonald's Commerce Avenue. And PDF 242, study on the book of Ephesians. We're talking about um, labor relations and uh, work ethics in the workplace. 7 p.m., Jollibee Commerce Avenue. Let's pray together as we end our worship this morning. Lord, thank you for coming down and saving us. Thank you. You're the one king, the only king we know who made the law that the penalty for our sin is death and then came down and paid for it himself. Help us not to waste that sacrifice, grabbing only the salvation but not living in sanctification. Help us to live our lives loving you with all of our hearts, mind and soul. Help us to honor you with our title, Christians, and tell others about you. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday, everyone.